following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. How are you doing out there in Radio Land? I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. Hey, if you want, you can give me a call, 877-207-2276. You ever had one of those days where, <laughs> wow, uh, I need a conductor to tell me which direction to go at what what second. Uh, this has been one of those days. I'm getting so busy, you know, uh, busy and uh, busier and busier as I get older. And most of retire, but I'm not going to. You know, I got oh, I got years left in me to serve God. Anyway, there you go. Hey, if you want to give me a call, eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Please give me a call. We can talk if you want. You can email me at info at carm dot org. Info i n f o of course at carm c a r m dot o r g. Carm dot org. Give me uh, give me uh, an email there. You just put in the subject title. You know, radio question or radio comment. And i uh, got some stuff I can talk about today with that. And if you guys are interested, you can watch us on Facebook. You can watch us on uh, YouTube. You can watch us on uh, Rumble. And you can watch us on uh, Clubhouse. And, you can, well, not watch us, but you can listen on Clubhouse and also in Discord. It doesn't matter where you go, uh, but whatever way uh, you know works for you to, to, uh, to check it out and hopefully enjoy the show that way. Wow. All right, all right, all right. So let's get to jump on the phones here. We have four open lines. If you want to give me a call, eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Let's get to Gabe. Uh, I'm clicking on Gabe's thing. It's not coming up. I don't know why it's not working. Maybe the producer can click it and access it. There we go. I'll, I'll redo it during the break. Gabe, welcome. You're on the air. Are you there, Gabe? Hello. Yes, you're on the airplane. Hello. So what do you got? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? So yeah, it's David, not Gabe. Oh, David. Okay. All right, Dave. Yeah. No, so worries. what do you got, man? What's up? So how are you, Matt? Uh-huh. Yeah, so I, I've called him before. I've heard you talk about uh, mm-hmm. just looking at Scripture for the end times regarding the one is taken, one is lost, left in the mm-hmm. field, the wheat and the tares. Mm-hmm. And I really respect your teaching and, and your explanation of those make perfect sense. The only thing that I'm trying to reconcile, and uh, I don't know if I can ask you to play devil's advocate, if you will, from a different point of view, if you had to try and explain how that could be interpreted differently, because... If he's How what could be interpreted like differently? Thief, what, wait, wait, what's uh, the, those, what? those two sections of scripture that because uh, oh, wait, 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 hold okay. on, hold on, yes, hold on. Yes, you're yes, going to finish your sorry, sentences. Sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. The, 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 right. I ask you what it is. You say the one's that, and then right, right before you give oh, me the sorry. answer, you go to something else. So I need to. What are you? Okay. What are you ta- specifically right. talking about? Sorry, I'll slow down. So the thief in the night. Right, one is okay. taken, one is lost. Right. So Those are, wait, 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 hold on. You just hold it. You just referenced First Thessalonians and also Matthew twenty-four. Okay, you just cross-referenced okay. them. So, All right. Right. Thank you. So, okay. if if we do, you, do you believe the seven-year tribulation? Do we think that that seven years yes. is literal or figurative? Oh, I think it's really going to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sorry. Yes, I believe there's going to be a literal seven-year tribulation. Yeah. Okay. So if if we believe that to be true, and I guess they're not, if I remember correctly, you said you don't think there's two separate events. There's just one coming of the Lord. Correct. No. What? No. Not not exactly. There are separate events that happen okay. at the, uh, very close to the same time of each other. Okay. So the rapture would occur. And then, as far as him establishing the reign and rule, and I understand the thousand years is some question you mentioned whether you think that's literal and figurative. Is that correct? Well, the, the thousand, thousand years. Year rule and reign? 
the thousand years is in a figurative context. And most people just okay. take it literally without examining the context to see uh, what's going on. So if the right, so if the wicked are taken first, and then that would be like no one knows when that time would come. That would be like a thief in the night, right? The thief in the night is, that is in the thief in the night so, is in reference the the thief. Go ahead. Okay. The thief in the night is in reference to the return of Christ when he comes with the trumpet, the angels, and the dead in Christ are raised up, and then we who are alive remain shall be caught up together. That's the rapture, and that's what comes uh, like the return comes like a thief in the night. Okay? Okay. All right. So, if, so is there a certain event where like a clock would start ticking so to speak but we can definitely say okay the tribulation period like is it the appearance of the antichrist for example the seven years has started the general theory is the antichrist will be revealed as the antichrist in the middle of the tribulation period and it'd be a great tribulation oh that's period. interesting yeah okay and so so one I one theory is that the rapture occurs and that starts the right. seven-year tribulation period. The problem with that is we don't see two returns of Christ, only one, and <clears throat> not a partial return, but only one return. And the other thing is, if it happens, the return of Christ is seven years after the tribulation period begins with the rapture, then you'll know exactly what day he's coming back. And it's right. supposed to be noble. So that's, there's right. a problem there. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. So mid, mid-trib... Potentially rapture, is that what I'm hearing you saying? No. Okay. My opinion is so, that the rapture occurs uh -huh. at the end of the seven year tribulation period. And the middle of the tribulation okay. period is when the Antichrist is revealed as the Antichrist, according to Second Thessalonians. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So I'm so I'm I'm driving so I can't do a search on my computer for the verse that talks about um sorry i lost my train of thought for a minute there right. so for the for the rapture right so if that's the the end of the seven years then wouldn't we somehow we would know like all eyes will see right is that my Interpreting that right, all ears will hear the coming of the Lord. Yeah, that's what it says. And when, whenever He returns, everybody will see. Everybody's going to be aware of it. Okay. And we, and right. that's something that we would, if we survive the tribulation period, if the Antichrist is revealed midpoint, so to speak, right at three and a half years, then mm -hmm. we would have some sort of time frame of that coming moment right it's another reference okay. point because when he goes into the temple to uh, have people believe that he's god in flesh then that's the midpoint that's one of the theories it's the midpoint of the tribulation period and if that's the case then you would know from the midpoint you would know how long it would be before uh, the return of christ was okay and then as we read through Revelation, it's, and it talks about the different bowls being poured out, is it pretty clear of, like, at what stage, like, if we, could we guesstimate, like, at what years or what stage each judgment would be being poured out? Is that very likely? There's, we will be familiar. During, yes, we'll be familiar with what's going on in the tribulation period. There'll be famine, earthquakes, plagues, and things like that. And uh, those who are aware uh, and are biblically minded on earth will uh, will see what's going on. Okay? They'll know. All right? Because Scripture also has mentioned if the days were not shortened, no one would survive correct right matthew 24 and 22 yes and uh i have an opinion about that i, I my opinion is that uh when genesis two seventeen, god said to adam the day that you eat you will die and he did die that day uh but he he died spiritually and i think that he was talking to not only adam but all of mankind in adam 
And I, I, my, my, uh, what I lean towards is that mankind is going to destroy itself. This is the wages of sin is death. And those who reject God are going to bring themselves to death and others around them to death. And so I suspect that they'll be uh, basically uh, on the verge of a nuclear holocaust worldwide and that God will come back at the last moment for a gigantic, I told you so, and he's going to take the wicked. As <laughs> Jesus says in Matthew 13, he'll first take the wicked, first take the tares and bind them, then to gather the wheat. So Jesus says the first ones gathered at the end of the age are the, uh, the wicked. And they're taken uh, for judgment to be burned. In Matthew 24, Luke 17, two men in the field, one is taken, one is left. In the context, one who's taken are the wicked. And in Luke 17, when they asked Jesus where they're taken, he says where the body is, the vultures are gathered. So uh, my opinion is that we're going to go through the tribulation. We're going to see the arrival of the Antichrist. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be beheaded. We're going to be jailed, killed for the faith. And... Um, then, uh, as it gets really bad, and the war of uh, Armageddon is going to occur. I've seen the Valley of Armageddon, and well, how big it is. It's hum humongous. Um, probably Japan, uh, probably uh, China will come out from the east along the dried-up Euphrates River uh, with a 200-million-man army. Uh, probably Magog, Moscow, Russia will come down from the north and take a spoil out of, of Israel. The Dead Sea has some of the richest minerals in it in the world. And if they can start extracting it uh, economically and technologically, it'll be in the trillions of dollars. Uh, it'll be become the richest nation in the world very quickly. And so it looks like, well, this is a possibility, that these nations will come in for a spoil, and then Israel will destroy them. And this will uh, signify, uh, in part, the return of Christ and some other stuff going on. And I, these are the things. I mean, no one knows for sure, but this is how I kind of put things together. Okay. Right. Hey, I, I greatly appreciate your obviously dedication to the study and and uh, your ministry. So, thank you. I appreciate it. You're God welcome. bless you. You're welcome. Well, God and, bless. And uh, I hope to talk to you again one day. Thanks. All right. Sounds good. All right. Bye -bye. Okay. Thanks. All right, Keith. I can't uh, drop. I don't know. I'll get back into it after the break. Um, if you can get Martin on next, that'd be fine. Click him on. There we go. Hey, Martin. Hey, man, you're on the air, buddy. Hey, Matt. Hey. hey, all right, thanks. Hey, God's blessing to you, buddy. Thanks for your ministry. Oh, I praise God. Um, Thank you. So this week, I I, I was kind of the tail end of the callers. Got, got, you know, I wasn't able to get on, but I think you had a couple flat earthers call in. Mm. And, mm. and and you were very patient, very good, obviously mm. kind and loving. It's kind of like a Charlie thing. When when you left for a week, Charlie took over. It was kind of the kind Matt when, when, when he was <laughs> Charlie's on. a great guy. Yeah, but he's not been uh, traumatized for over 20 years of radio. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he hasn't been beaten down yet. Okay. That's right. That's right. So, so, yeah. So one person had mentioned that, you know, he kept throwing up, well, why can I see the moon and the sun at the same time in the sky? And it's like I, I crossed that path a few times, and I go, well, <laughs> but why is it you can't see the whole moon and the sun? And it's, it, You know, why is the sun only casting half the moon's light? You know, if it's flat... If you and the sun is shining on it, you should be able to see the whole thing and not half the thing. And that that kind of shows that. Well, I'm the not sure I understand that. Can you hold on? We got a break. And um, hold on, yeah, we'll be right back. Okay, bet. okay. And so uh, keep a little out. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, we have two open lines, 877-207-2276. Martin, you're back on the air. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Yeah, so so this was in reference to one of the flat earthers that talked about, um, you know, they could, yes. you know, if I can see the sun and the moon, at the same time, then obviously something's got to be flat here. Now, in reference to the moon and flat mooners, I mean, if you're a flat earther, you have to be a flat mooner. Um, if you can see the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time, granted, they say it's not an eclipse. Um, it's because the sun is, is, is illuminating 
a portion of the moon. If the moon were truly flat, then the sun would illuminate the whole moon when you see both of them in the night sky. If it were truly flat, and if the moon is a sphere, right. then you wouldn't see the full moon, and you know it would be what you see now if it was a sphere. Right. So you, so you reject uh, flat Earth, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've I illustrated it. it. It's, yeah, I've illustrated it many different ways. The the moon's the easiest one to make sense of. That uh, the yeah. dome idea, it, it just, it, the flat earth model is really ridiculous. It, it is just dumb. It really is. And they need to, uh, the flat earthers need to stop wasting time, uh, wasting our time with it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it just takes, I mean, it, it took one person a simple ping pong ball and a flashlight on a flat table to kind of illustrate and show yeah. these are spheres. And then if you okay. use the, the quarter penny nickel thing and show their theory of the flat, I mean, it, it just it can't be proven. It, can, it just it's can't ridiculous. physically show that. Yeah, it's uh, but a lot of flat earthers don't hold to the idea that the uh, moon is flat. They say it's cylinder. It's uh, it's a sphere, and so a lot of uh, flat earthers hold to the idea. And there's different flat earth models. There's no uniform position, and the reason is because there's so many difficulties with the theory that different people come up with different theories and different models. And so when they have a flat earth convention, which I would love to go to, I would actually oh, love goodness, to go to. Oh, goodness. Have those. Oh, wow. No, that I would. would. Be, uh, that'd be, yeah. That would be entertaining. You're right. Oh, yeah. I've been to an atheist convention, and uh, I enjoyed that. I'd like to go to a UFO convention, and I'd like to go to a flat earth convention. I, I would. I think that would be, be fun to go to. So, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, there's time. I mean, spend some time and money on places that are entertaining. And you can enjoy, yeah. Yeah, better than Disneyland. <laughs> but actually, and then the best of all, you folks, the best of all is a New Age convention. Oh my goodness, that's the entertainment, New Age convention. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been to one yeah or, or go to the the DNC convention. That's kind of close. <laughs> you're Republican or Democrat, I'll tell you, that they're just. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, 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 you're right. It's getting kind of very polarized out there. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't even watch politics anymore. I can't watch the news. I want to start yelling and throwing things at the TV because I'm so in, enraged by the stupidity of the people putting our borders. New COVID, this and crap going with Biden. He's obviously a puppet. You know, the, the woke idiocy, the stupidity in schools. I, I just can't take it anymore. I got to do something else. So focusing. No, on you're right. Yeah, I stopped watching. I, I kind of changed the channel from the news while I'm working. I think my blood pressure went down on about 10 points. Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh-huh. Yep. I can't do anything about it, but I sure, I can't say anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matt. All right, man. God bless. Yeah, All right. Hey, folks, if you want to give me a call, all you got to do is dial 877 Two two seven six. Let's get to. Let's try Adrian. Hey Adrian, welcome. You're on the air. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. Now, You're welcome. This is off the cuff. This is off the cuff because I was out with some girlfriends of mine having dinner, and we were talking about uh, the Methodist Church and the homosexuality situation. And then one of the ladies brought up about, well, have you heard about the Methodists wanting to take Jesus out? And we were all just dumbfounded. So I, I, you, I, I haven't researched it. I just, it just was mentioned. Do you know anything about that? I have not heard anything about the UMC, United Methodist Church, um, uh, removing Jesus uh, at all. So I don't know. The United Methodist Church okay. is is basically apostate. Okay, they're liberal yes. and women pastors and elders and uh, homosexual yeah. and woke idiocy and stuff like that. Oh God, yes, oh Lord. Okay, well we were all just flabbergasted, so I got in the car and just called you. <laughs> well, yeah, we need to see documentation on something like that. That's what would be interesting. To, to see if something yeah. is is moving in where they want to start removing Jesus masculinity from the Bible, you know I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, because uh, people are moving more towards apostasy as time goes on. I'd like to see it, but oh. okay. So there. Doesn't it hurt your soul. 
God is in control. And thank That's you, right. sir. You're welcome. All right. Well, God bless. Okay. You too, dear. Take care. Bye. All right. Well, that was Adrian. And now let's just jump over to Scott from Washington State. Hey, Scott, welcome. You're on the air. Scott, you're on the air. I did click the button right. You're on. Are you there, buddy? We'll keep trying. Okay. All right. I don't hear you. Let me put you on uh, hold and then try and get you back on. And it didn't seem to work, so something's up with that call particularly. All right, so let's get over to Jeff from South Carolina. Jeff, welcome. You're on the air. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Hello, Matt. Yes. Yes. So what do you got? What's um, up? Oh, I just had a question. Um, I listen to you a lot, but uh, um, in First Corinthians 13.10, Mm-hmm says, uh, but when that which is perfect is calm, then that which is in part shall be the, mm-hmm. shall be done away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the charismatics say that, well, it's when Jesus comes, it's when it's perfect is calm, but I agree. some say that it's when the, uh, the canonization of Scripture, mm-hmm. the Bible, yes. yeah. yeah. And then some um, people say that it's when you, when you pass away. No, that's not when you pass away. Um, that's an interesting one. I never heard that one, but it doesn't fit. Uh, you're breathing into the phone, just so you know. I've got your, your phone in there. Um, so it said, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Okay. And so uh, it says, when as a child, I spoke as a child and thought as a child. Let me get this going so people can see this, too. There we go. So, uh, for now we've seen a, a mirror dimly, but then face to face. So this is what it is. When the perfect comes, that's when you're going to see face to face. When the perfect comes, it says you'll be known as you're fully known. This is not the completion of the canon. It doesn't fit. It just does not mm-hmm. fit. It's the completion of the canon. So, uh, in, that's what it says there. It makes sense to say that it's a return of Christ. And the reason I'll go to that is because of 1 Corinthians 1, 7. That, so that you are not lacking any gift. And the word gift there is charismati, which we get charismatic. You're not lacking any charismatic gift awaiting eagerly the return, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul equates the return of Christ with the, with the gifts. So it's up to that point, and that's what I, I think is going on in First Corinthians 13. Please hold on, because we've got to Yeah, break. that's kind of what I always thought. All right. All right, hey folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. All right, let's get back on with Jeff. Jeff, you still there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So that's why I believe that uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is about the return of Christ. Okay? Okay. So what, what was good? that scripture you gave me in reference uh, to First that? 1 uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians 1, 7. 1 Corinthians okay. 1, 7. So that you're not lacking in any gift, but the word in Greek is charisma, not doron. It's a charismatic gift, Okay waiting eagerly for the revelation, apocalypse, apocalypse, for the return of Christ. So you're not lacking any okay. gift while you're waiting for the return of Christ. All right? So yeah, I kind of grew up in a Presbyterian church, and then uh, uh-huh. later on, I, uh, about 12 years ago, I started going to Pentecostal church, and so it's a lot different, you know. Yes, um, just uh, so you know. And then... You know, be careful with Pentecostal churches. I stopped churches. going to the Pentecostal church. I went back to the church I grew up in. It's a Presbyterian ARP associate okay, reform. They're okay. Yeah, they're okay, I think. As long as they don't have women pastors and elders. But um, John no, no, Knox... They're very conservative. Good. Good. Well, John Knox, Robert Fleming, and George Wishart, they're from the 15 and 1600s, and they moved in the charismatic gifts. And they were Presbyterians. So. Oh, John Knox. Oh, yeah, John Knox. Absolutely. Okay. Uh huh. John Knox um, had a word of knowledge. I can read it to you out of work and books and stuff like that. I have it on another website. 
Um, he foretold the manner of his surrender or deliverance. He prophesied. Uh, that's what John Knox did. He wouldn't be allowed in a lot of Presbyterian churches today. Mm. Oh, really? Well, yeah. You know, um, I believe in the in uh, infant baptism, okay? Here's an example of something. But not for salvation. I believe it's a covenant sign, and if you don't agree, that's fine. I just, that's just my theological you say infant position. infant baptism? Yeah, I, I affirm it, but not for salvation. I, I affirm it as a covenant sign. So here's just a, an example oh, of something. Okay. And so I have my reasons for it, and I can, I can show why I, I hold to it biblically. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but sure, the, uh, the, point I say, the point, the reason I bring this up is there are denominations. I was trying to get into a, a denomination, a Reformed denomination, where they allowed the charismatic gifts. And, uh, you know, I don't practice them. I just believe they're continued. And everything was fine, contemporary worship, everything was great. And then they said, because I held to infant baptism, they wouldn't even let me teach a Bible study, a simple Bible study. And oh. I, I, yeah, it's just ridiculous. And uh, and I said, well, John Knox, you know, George Wishart, these guys moved in and 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 these gifts, we have, you know, no comment. And people yeah, why do they that. get so uppity about things and then cause division when it doesn't need to be there? I, it just bothers me. Yeah, George Wishart, John Fleming, uh, Robert Fleming, excuse me, and John Knox. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. I'll call you back in another time and talk about another subject, uh, but sure. I know you probably have other callers. So. Yeah, we got. I'd like right. to ask, talk to you about the King James version. And uh, well, I can tell you, it's a good Bible, but there are better ones out there. Okay, King James is not uh, perfect. I, I, mean, I love listening to you, and uh, mm -hmm. I like you know supporting the Trinity and all that. But uh, when you <laughs> when you say don't stay away from the King James version, I almost cut you off. I'm like, well, wait no, a minute. <laughs> no. No, I say stay with the King James when you want to do serious apologetics. That's when you want to stay away from it. Serious apologetics, oh. when you're really getting down deep, then the King James will get in your way in several areas. And it will. Okay. But, but, but if know. you know if you know where these areas are of difficulty, then you can work with them. But most people don't know about Titus two thirteen, Romans five eighteen and the King James, for example, or Kama Jehanium. They don't know about these difficulties. Yeah. So uh, they but, just um, think the King James is perfect. When it comes to the not. deity of Christ, there's a lot of places in the new versions that, I mean, the them. King James. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, but the uh, King James does too. The King James does too. The King James. Yeah. Uh, the I don't King think so. I don't believe Yes, that. it does. Oh, absolutely, it does. Yeah. In, uh, in uh, Titus 2.13, it, it uh, mistranslates the Greek so that the deity of Christ is lessened. Titus two thirteen. So, absolutely. What about? Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know which verse it is. It's uh, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. It right. says in the new versions, but in the King James version, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So that's like a total opposite. Well, like no, the King James it's, is saying, uh, says it's not robbery to be equal to God, and the other ones are saying it's not to be grasped. It's Philippians two six. He did not regard equality with God, it had to be grasped, okay? So the word grasp, harpogmon, okay? And it can mean to seize by force, to being in the form of. Uh, it, could be, it could have different meanings in different contexts, all right? So, uh, and I can read through, you know, I got a lexicon in front of me. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, harpogmon. Uh, so, uh, and so some would say to grasp, uh, and the NASB says, uh, literally, uh, it, it means uh, to be utilized or asserted. The word is difficult to translate. So th claiming that Jesus was who he was, wasn't something that he robbed from God or usurped from God or grabbed from God, because the word argument can mean those things. Okay. Well, what about, uh, first Timothy three sixteen or uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of God, and if God was manifest in the flesh in the King James Verse. Yeah, the God was here, manifest in the flesh. I mean, that's yes. like, okay. Can I address it? God, so there's no getting around I, I got you. Let, let me address it, okay? The King James is translated with 5th century documents, and it has more time for a little bitty uh, commentaries that are written by some scribes to creep in. And so, uh, the, the generally speaking, the older manuscripts are the more reliable ones. The older ones don't have that. Okay? All right. Are you there? Okay. 
Did you need to do some research on it. Because the, king, the people, when they say the King James is the true one, and blah, blah, it's just not, not the case. People who studied it know it's just not the case. No Bible is the right out. one. Okay. There was a book that somebody gave me that uh, got me really interested in all that. The New Age Bible version is what the name of it. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. The manuscript and, uh, and all that. Look, I'm, I'm very familiar with this kind of stuff, and it, I find it to be irritating because the people, what they do are selectively assert certain values to support their presupposition. They don't look at the evidence. They don't look at manuscript evidence. They don't look at what's going on translation principles. They don't do it. And so then they, they just want to look for something to say that the King James is a true one. Well, if they, if they want to hold to that, then go to the 1611. And I would I'd caution you, go to the 1611 and see if you can read it, the original. Because what most people have is read not it, the 1611. Well, hold on, let me hold on. Okay, we're going to move along. We're going to move along. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. Nice <laughs> talking to you. All right. Um, so let's get to. Let's see. Try back to uh, Scott from uh, Washington. Hey, Scott. Welcome. You're on the air. Hey, how's it going, Matt? It's going, man. It's going. What do you got, buddy? So um, you know, it's not often that I run into verses in the Bible that sort of run into my theology a little bit. I'm a Five point Calvinist, uh, similar to your theology, quite similar, I would say. Um, and so, if you wouldn't mind going to Luke seven twenty nine and thirty in the New King James, if you would, since that's what I'm in. Uh, and yeah, the, my question with it, uh, let me know when you're there. Yeah, I'm trying to find the New King James. Uh, I use the NESB, but uh, but go ahead. So the New King James, um, there's, I have sort of two questions okay. in this, but the bigger one is, it, it says that the Pharisees and the lawyers read of God for themselves. With my theology, I thought that wasn't possible, and I still do. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could expound on what it's actually saying there. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So they rejected the will of God. Well, they, they did it because that's what they did what's the problem well I mean I just thought that you know the will of God really couldn't be rejected it, it would just <sighs> get down to more okay. in the prescriptive will yes now we're talking about the uh, all the um, the ultimate the proximate uh, excuse me um, the decretive will the prescriptive will and the permissive will so uh, the, these are for those who don't know the ultimate will of God is, he said, that to be light, it's going to happen. Uh, he, you know, and, or the um, decretive will, excuse me, uh, decree. He decrees certain things are going to happen by his direct action. The prescriptive will is, uh, he says, don't lie. The permissive will, he lets you lie. All of these are his will. He wills to let you disobey him. And so he's willing, uh, he, he lets them uh, disobey him. Yeah. And God has a prescriptive will for the Pharisees. And it's revealed in the scriptures. The Pharisees rejected it. The lawyers rejected it also, along with what Christ was saying. And uh, they wanted their own will, the will of God, which is perfectly consistent with God's sovereignty because it deals with the total depravity of man and their lack of ability and their own fallenness, their lack of ability to follow the will of God, and they just acted accordingly. And they, they, it was a choice they made. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's sort of what I assume. I just wanted to double check on that. So good. Uh, thank you for that. I just have one more, um, if that's all right. That'd well, be Romans break. chapter 2. Break. Romans 2 what? Oh, okay. We'll, Romans 2 what? Uh, 2.13. Okay, we'll be right back after these messages, folks. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Everybody, welcome back to the show. Just want to say thanks for listening. And if you'd be so kind as considering supporting us, we would like that because we've got to keep the lights on. And if you want to help out and you like what the show is about and, and you tolerate what I say, well, maybe you might want to consider supporting us. Just go to carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G and uh, forward slash uh, donate. That would be awesome. Hey, uh, let's see. Jay, you're still back on. You're on the air again. Scott, I mean. Go ahead. Yep. So, yeah, my question was just Romans 2.13. Uh, you know, I, I believe in justification by faith alone, and it 
Uh, Romans 2 in general, there's a lot of places that sounds like it's prescribing law keeping. I was just wondering if you could expound on 2.13 as well as 25 and others that sort of do that, you know? Yes. So I've taught Romans many times and uh, teaching through it now. So here's the overall context. You see what what, uh, Paul the Apostle is doing. Is he it does an introduction, and then and uh, he starts talking about the nature of the gospel, and you know in uh, Romans one sixteen, to the Jew first and the Greek also. Why to the Jew first? Notice that in, in verse seventeen he quotes uh, Habakkuk two four, but the righteous shall live by faith. All right. So what he's doing is talking to uh, the Jews. If you go to Romans two seventeen, but if you bear the name Jew and rely on the law and boast in, in God. In uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 1, therefore you have no excuse, everyone who's passing judgment. So there's, I'm just jumping around, but I want you to get the overall picture of what's happening. Because in Romans chapter 1, from 18 on to 31, what Paul is doing is, uh, 32 that is, is he's condemning the, uh, he's saying that the, the wrath of God is coming upon everybody. Everybody's going to be in trouble. Okay, and, and all in godliness is, is under judgment. And he's talking, he's trying to get the Jews to think. Because look, the unbelievers are doing these bad things, and they, they go to homosexuality, they go to, to idolatry, and the Jews are going to be nodding their head. And then now you go to verse t- uh, 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who pass a judgment, for in that you, you, you judge another, you condemn yourself. So this is what he's talking about here. He says, you know the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Do you think the riches of his kindness and tolerance, you know, lead you to repentance? And he quotes the Old Testament again in verse 6. In Psalm 62, verse 12, he'll render to each man according to his deeds. So he's addressing the Jews. Then he says, in verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Now remember, the Jew thought that what they're doing is keeping themselves right with God by their works. That's what the Roman Catholics teach. That's what uh, Eastern Orthodox teach. A lot of our uh, Protestants teach. You you keep yourself right with God by your repentance, your good, good works, which is heresy. And he says there's no partiality with God in verse 11. Now, because the Jew is going to say that there is partiality because he ta- he uh, picked the Jewish nation. So he's, got, he's favorable over the Jews, uh, for, for over the Greeks, that is, the Jews over the Greeks. And, but Paul says there's no partiality. All who sinned without the law will perish without the law. The law is a reference to the Mosaic Revelation. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So now he's saying if you don't have the law, you're not judged by it. But you have the law, Jew. You're in trouble. Then he says, it's not the hearers. Well, verse 12 I skipped. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. Okay, I already go through that. And it, then he goes to verse 13. It's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law be justified. And it's true. The doers of the law are justified. That, the Jews know that. Everybody knows that. The problem is, no one can keep the law. You can't. It's impossible to keep that law. So the Jews think that they're the ones who are righteous and that they can keep the law and be justified. But what he's saying is the doers are going to be justified. Isn't that right, Mr. Jew? For when the Gentiles who don't have the law do the things of the law in that they show the law written on their heart, then they're going to be be okay. See, what he's doing, he's not saying you can achieve salvation by your works. He's appealing to the Jewish mindset that you have to understand, yeah, you can be made by, by the law with perfection, but you're not even keeping it. Because because in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says that. He says, everyone who passes judgment in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. You practice the very same things. He's saying, you're guilty of what you accuse the unbelievers of doing. But they have a law. They sometimes act better than you do. So they're going to be above you. This is what so he's going reminding on them, them of their own held theology. I, I do that right. a lot, and I witness to Mormons. So you're sort of reminding them what they say they believe. Is that what's going on? That's what he's doing. He's using, okay. he's hoisting them by their, or they're hoisting themselves by their own petard. He's using the law against them, showing that yeah, you can keep the law, you'd be right, but nobody can. That's why they have to have sin sacrifices. But the Gentiles, they don't have the law formally, but they're doing the things. And if you want to say, hey, you keep the law and you'll be okay, then they're going to be okay. That's what he's doing. Mm. He's showing them. Then he goes to verse 17. If you bear the name Jew and rely on the law and boast, you know as well and prove the things. He goes on. So, so, so what he's trying to do is get the Jew to think. 
It's like, and every Christian should hear this. If you think in any way you keep yourself right with God by your works, in any way, oh, that's heresy. But the thing is that if you want to claim that you keep yourself right with God by anything you do, well, then you're guilty because you condemn others, but you do the same thing. No one's perfect. The standard of law keeping is Jesus, not yourself. And so the Jews had the idea that they in themselves could keep that law, but they're actually guilty. He's pointing it out. He set them up. See how bad the Gentiles are, all this stuff in Romans chapter 1? Oh, you're so bad. Hey, but you do the same things. And he shows them how. You appeal to the law, but you don't even keep that law. He's, yeah, that is true. At the end of Romans 1, it goes right into 2. Obviously, they didn't have chapters then. Um, right. Yeah, I'm reminded of that now. Do you have time for one more quick one? Very fast, because we've got two callers waiting. Go ahead. Okay, very simple. First Peter 2.12, what does the day of visitation mean? Uh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, some say it's the, from what I understand, it's the day of judgment or the day of return of Christ. Or... Uh, but that's what I was at the top of my head. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, yeah, that's, that's all I got. I mean, I got a lot more, but we don't got time, so that's okay. Right. <laughs> and uh, visitation there is a Greek word, uh, episkopes. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Act of visiting or visiting inspected. Anyway, from epic, uh, episkeptomai, to visit upon, to consider the visitation, the return of Christ, it looks like. All right, buddy probably that okay thank sure. you all right man god bless all right let's see next longest waiting is jay from ohio hey jay welcome you're on the air hey reverend slick how you doing sir <laughs> reverend slick i never get used to that but uh <laughs> doing okay hanging in there man what do you got <laughs> good brother um i just had a question for you here uh john nine thirty one. Okay. um you know, I'll, I'll read it real quick here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Um, so I, I believe that regeneration precedes faith. Um, how does God, if he doesn't listen to sinners or somebody who is not uh, saved, let's say, how does he hear a prayer of repentance when somebody comes to Christ? For one thing, John is speaking uh, to a, a broader audience than Matthew might. Matthew's right. speaking mainly to the Jews. But uh, when you look at this, it's in the context of what's going on, the Pharisees brought uh, someone uh, to him earlier on in the chapter. And so we know the Jews are highly involved. And then he says, verse 29, we know that Moses has, uh, God spoke to Moses. But as for this man, we don't know where he's from. So he's talking to the Jews, all right? And uh, the man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened uh, my eyes. So this is the one who's who said that is the one who was, his mind, uh, his eyes were opened. If you go and you read Romans 9, you'll see a progression of this man's proclamation of who Christ is. From ignorance down to a proclamation. Mm. It's really at his steps. And uh, he says, we know that God does not hear sinners. Now, what he's talking about there, he's a Jew. He's talking from the Jewish perspective. Now, the Jews were covenant people. They were under the covenant awareness of God, relationship with God. And uh, they believed in God. It's what they did. And what he's saying, he doesn't hear sinners. He, you know, He's talking in the Jewish context here, and basically all sinners, that if you are abiding in sin, he's not going to listen to you. But he is not saying that it's like a, a reformed charismatic, I mean, excuse me, a reformed Calvinistic ideology here. What's going on is a generic statement that a Jew would say, we know God doesn't listen to sinners. If you're, you know, you're walking you know, with your neighbor and you push him into a ditch and you, you kill him, God's not going to listen to you for an appeal. He's, he's talking like that. He doesn't hear these sinners, those who rebel against God. He's not going to hear them. But if anyone is God-fearing, does as well, then he hears them. So he's just giving a an overall uh, wisdom statement, a truth statement. That's all that's going on. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Because I, me and my wife and I were talking about this, and um, hi, cat. <laughs> and uh, we were like, well, obviously, you know, it doesn't it it doesn't mean that God doesn't hear them because clearly uh, right. he hears everything. Um, but yeah, I I had always kind of wondered about that because well, like. It, 
and I, I understand what you mean about the context thing. Um, so I'm kind of like pigeonholing that into what my real question is, I suppose. But if somebody isn't uh, regenerated or if somebody isn't saved, um, when they repent, you, you, you would, you would affirm regeneration before faith, correct? Yes. Logical progression, not temporal, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay. So that would be like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm thinking out loud here. That makes Sorry. sense. What you, what you're saying though. I, I, I assume that there's a, there's a broader context. Like you said, with John, um, it does seem to be kind of going to like the wider picture. Uh, but yeah, just something I've always kind of wondered about. I'm the guy at the family gathering who always gets called on to pray. And, uh, Good. you know, I always, I love doing that because I have a lot of unsaved family and, uh, you know, I spend a good deal of my prayer life petitioning the Lord on their behalf. Good. Um, so to do that, you know, and I, that's kind of where my, my question's coming from, I suppose. But that's all right. anyway, I have the same <laughs> issue. My wife's brothers are unbelievers and uh, we go, we do a family thing on her side. I'm the one who's asked to pray mm. and uh, I yeah. pray to Jesus. I let them know who Jesus is yep. by just a prayer to him. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I said to my brother-in-law, I say, hey, Ken, you repented from your uh, your sins yet? He goes, oh, I'll do it later. You know, so. <laughs> that's how it yeah, yeah. Well, I always thought that, too, before I was saved. I'll just do it right before I die. I'll just say I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. right. That's right. Yep. Now the day of salvation. All right, my brother. Well, I appreciate you, man. All right, brother. God bless. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yep. God bless. All right. Bye-bye. All right, so there we are. We're out of time. We've got about uh, 30 seconds left at most. And uh, may the Lord bless you. I hope you hope you have a good weekend. Um, please pray for this ministry. We do need that prayer. Oh, and uh, our guy, I forgot to mention this, our guy in, um, in uh, Nigeria, Moto is the word that we were using, not his real name. Things are going well. The Muslims were at each other's throats during the uh, court appearance. And... Basically, it's going to probably get dismissed now because of it, because they have no witnesses that have anything to hold on to. Praise God. Remember us in prayer, and please consider supporting us. We would love that. Uh, just go to karm.org forward slash donate. We do need that support, and uh, may the Lord bless you. Have a great weekend, everybody, and by His grace, we'll be back on the air on Monday. We'll talk to you then. God bless. Bye. Another program powered by the Truth Network.